is it time? Should we start? Hello and welcome to this webinar. My name is Renee Giovarelli and I'm the co-founder of Resource Equity and Senior Gender Advisor and Lawyer. I have over 25 years of experience working on gender issues related to land tenure and customary and legal property rights and I'm still learning so very happy to be here. In a moment, we'll be introducing our three main panelists and hearing from three West African countries, Liberia, Ghana, and Nigeria, on developments in women's land rights under customary tenure. Before that, we'll be introducing a newly published set of country por portfolios, an online knowledge piece developed by Land Portal, which provides a summary of the land governance situation in a number of countries. First of all, a few logistical notes. This webinar is being recorded and will be available later for consultation on the Land Portal website and on your YouTube channel. Following three rounds of questions to our panelists, we will have 30 minutes to address your questions. Please use the question and answer feature to pose your questions. You can also use the chat if you want others to see your questions. So let's introduce the webinar. The webinar today takes a deeper look into women's land rights and customary tenure. As in many other parts of the world, women work on land in most of West Africa, but do not have secure rights or access to the land they use. In all three countries we will hear from today, land is passed down from male to male, and women do not inherit ancestral land under customary law. At the same time, women tend to be largely underrepresented in decision-making positions at the local or national level, as a result of patriarchal norms, lack of knowledge and confidence, as well as their heavy workloads leading to time poverty. The importance of women's tenure security and its socioeconomic benefits have gained increasing awareness and momentum in West Africa over the past decade. And in Ghana and Liberia, the land law provides some positive steps forward, creating a space for change. The objective of this webinar, however, is to highlight ongoing tenure and securities for women beyond statutory law. We wanna explore new ways towards equitable practices of land tenure and compare positive case examples. And we want to identify major challenges in promoting inclusive measures. For some further perspectives, I'd like to introduce speakers for today. I'll start with Anne Hennings, who is Land Portal's Local Knowledge Engagement Coordinator for West Africa. Anne has written the country portfolios for Ghana, Liberia, and Nigeria, and will, be, and will present them to you in a moment. Anne is also a postdoc research fellow at the Peace Academy Rhineland Palantir University of Landau. She holds a PhD in peace and conflict studies and has worked on land and resource issues for over 10 years, both in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia. Our panel will be composed of three persons. Firstly, Akua Apuka Pritwum, who is an associate professor at the Department of Labor and Human Resource Studies, University of Cape Coast, Ghana. In previous years, she served as the director of the Center for Research, Advocacy and Documentation. Her teaching and research cover various topics, including gender issues in development, development philosophy and theory, and women's labor status in the informal economy. The second panelist is Aluakemi Udo, who is a researcher at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Covenant University, Nigeria. Her PhD focused on the effectiveness of international conventions on women's rights, protecting their rights to property in Ogun State, Nigeria. She has published a number of articles on women's rights to property in peer reviewed journals. Last but not least, our third speaker is Justine Avuza, who serves as a senior land policy and gender advisor at Landessa. She's a lawyer specializing in law and development and holds a doctor of philosophy and sociology, gender and women's studies. 
Justine has more than two decades of experience in the fields of land rights, gender, women's rights, social justice, and others in sub-Saharan Africa context. Now we're gonna have a poll. Um, we would like you to, to conduct a very quick poll so that we know who's attending the webinar. There are two questions in the poll and some, op some options will shortly come up on your screen. The first question is, in which region are you based? And the second question, which sector do you represent? Do we have the results yet? Okay, in which region are you based? 18% uh, from West Africa, 16% from other sub-Saharan countries, 1% from Near East and North Africa, 7% Asia and Pacific, 25% North, South and Central America, and 34% Europe and Central Asia. Which sector do you represent? Government 7%, civil society 31%, private sector 6%, international organizations 21%, universities and knowledge institutes 28% and other 8%. So welcome to everyone, we're really happy to have you. So now we will move on and I will pass the floor to Anne Hennings, who will tell us a bit more about the countries which are the focus of our discussion today on women's land rights and customary tenure. Yeah, thank you, Renée. Um, this webinar is uh, part of the um, yeah, Land Portal's uh, Country Insights Initiative. Um, so yeah, over the past year, the Land Portal has been compiling a series of country portfolios um, that summarize uh, history and development of a country's um, land governance system and that analyzes um, key elements of the system, such as the uh, land legislation, trends in land use, how women access and control land uh, investments and more. Um, the portfolios uh, shall act as an entry point to learn about a new country, um, suggesting further resources for deeper exploration and uh, yeah, linking to uh, relevant news reports, blogs and data sets. Um, to have a look at them, you can go to the Land Portal website and click on the tab um, Countries. This month, uh, we have published portfolios um, on Ghana, Liberia and um, Nigeria. Mm. And over the next few minutes, I would like to give yeah, a few reflections on these three countries as an introduction. Um, Nigeria is uh, by far the largest with a population of almost 200 million people and with over 250 um, ethnic groups and uh, more than 500 uh, languages spoken. Nigeria is also home to Lagos, uh, which might become the world's first city, um, exceeding 100 million inhabitants. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, Liberia is the smallest country uh, with less than 5 million um, people. Nigeria and Ghana both endured periods of British and also German uh, rule. Ghana was, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana was the first to achieve independence from European rule in 1957. And Nigeria followed a few years later and became in a sovereign state in 1960. Uh, Liberia, on the other hand, declared independence from the private American colonization society as early as 1847. Mm, talking about the legal land system in each country, all of them, like Liberia, Ghana and Nigeria, um, are highly pluralistic, um, acknowledging statutory law, um, laws, uh, customary tenure and in Nigeria's case also um, Islamic, Islamic law. In Liberia, um, statutory law is primarily applied in the urban coastal area and customary law basically in the rest of the country. Um, similarly, uh, lineage is at the center stage of uh, land tenure in Ghana. So while family is, uh, land is uh, family or community owned, um, customary governments um, called stools in the south and skins in the north administer about 80% of all land uh, with chief acting um, yeah, as custodians. In Nigeria, land is vested, all land is vested in the state um, and customary law and Sharia law in the north are prevalent uh, in rural but also urban areas. Um, as in Liberia and Ghana, uh, 
people in rural areas turn to their chiefs or emirs uh, on land related matters. And all three countries, along with the uh, customary authorities who um, act as the custodians of the land clan lineage and also family heads of land owning families have a say in land governance. Um, there have been <clears throat> yeah, various attempts um, at land reform in, in all countries aiming to protect uh, customary land rights and enhance uh, tenure security. In Liberia, the long awaited Land Rights Act was passed in 2018, um, celebrated as a landmark law. Uh, it formally recognizes and protects customary land and women's rights uh, to land. Um, yeah, similarly, Ghana's new land bill was passed just in mid uh, 2020, um, and it's supposed to uh, consolidate and harmonize the existing 166 um, land related laws that exist in the country. And uh, it's also supposed to further strengthen customary tenure. In Nigeria, um, then President uh, Goodluck Jonathan acknowledged the need for reforms and reconstituted the uh, Presidential uh, Technical Committee on Land Reform um, 10 years ago. In terms of land use, uh, Ghana is the most urbanized country with about 56% of the population living in cities. Um, in Nigeria and Liberia, the population basically lives equally in rural and, and urban areas. Um, however, uh, next to artisanal mining, uh, agriculture remains the most important livelihood source in all three countries, um, employing about two thirds um, of the Nigerian populace, half of the population in Ghana, and still 43% in Liberia. Um, in all three countries, um, large scale agribusinesses and mining operations have had adverse impacts for residents and the environment and have led over time to contestation and in some cases also violence. In both northern Ghana and uh, northern Nigeria, uh, pastoralists practice uh, transhumans um, seasonally. In the final area I would like to mention uh, leads, uh, leads us to the main topic of today's webinar. Um, while the constitutions in all three countries provide women and men with equal rights in accessing property, uh, women's access to and also decision-making power over land and resources have remained highly vulnerable and limited in practice. Um, the exception here is Liberia, which uh, due to its recently passed uh, Land Rights Act, uh, provides stronger protection for women's land rights and strengthens also female participation on local, um, in local land management committees. However, inconsistencies and also patriarchal customs make this progressive legal framework very difficult to apply. For instance, uh, women's access to justice in rural areas uh, to enforce their rights uh, is limited. Also, uh, the management of joint property with spouses uh, remains, of course, obviously highly problematic in a patriarchal society. A similar picture unfolds in Ghana, where only 10% are female landholders, and women usually have only secondary access through their spouses, brothers, or fathers, or maybe even sons. Um, similarly, maintaining good relations with male family members um, is very important, um, yeah, actually in all countries and in Nigeria too. Here, women are, um, in Nigeria, women are, yeah, actually regarded as their spouse's property and as such are not, are not entitled um, to own land themselves um, according to customary practices. Um, the Sharia legal system in northern Nigeria, on the other hand, provides uh, women with some more rights. Um, in Nigeria, there were various uh, initiatives to promote um, gender equal, uh, equality and also to strengthen uh, women's land rights, uh, such as the national gender policy, um, but the implementation has remained yeah, weak so far. Did. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, our first question is, what are the key obstacles for women's access to land and tenure security in West Africa? What role do customary law and practices play? We like to start with Akua uh, to tell us a little bit about the women's tenure situation in Ghana. Yeah, thank you very much, Renee. And, and thanks also to the group for having me to share some of the experiences that one has had as a researcher and also as an activist. Now, um, uh, Anne really uh, covered uh, the major issues 
uh, that first, in, in terms of uh, tenure issues in Ghana, we are talking about how people get land. And once they also get the land, what rights they have. Uh, Anne has spoken extensively about the legal plural system, which means that communal uh, uh, norms and practices govern about 80% of the land that we have in Ghana, both for women and men. But then the key customary issues is, is first, first of all, how do people get land? And when they get the land, what kinds of rights do they have on, on, on other things on the land? What right do they have to make changes on the land? And can they also decide what they, they, who they want to give the land to and who they cannot? And all these are, are determined by uh, customary norms and practices. Now talking about West Africa, one thing we have in common is the fact that most of agricultural production is peasant based. And so this makes the household a production unit. So this brings me to my second point, which is talking about um, women and, and where they spend their adult working life. I have uh, made mention of the fact that most rural women spend their adult working life in marriages, not just rural women, but um, everybody, most women. And therefore uh, the household then becomes a production unit. As a production unit, it means then that women who, and we talk about two modes of, of access to land, the patrilineal system and the matrilineal system. People have said that the matrilineal system is superior to the patrilineal system, but we should note that the matrilineal system is not matriarchal, it's still patriarchal. And property and office is passed on through men to men. So once women move into marriages, they lose access if they are within the matrilineal system, they lose access to their land holding groups, land that they could get from their land holding groups. And therefore they, become, they get secondary access because the land they can access is through their husbands. Now, again, women's position within their marriage also structures what kind of land they can get. Do they have children? What kind of children do they have? Are they males or females? And, and, the, and the health of the marriage, are they divorced? Are they separated? Are they widowed? And, and so you find out that within their own natal families, households, they are viewed as transient members. And then within their marital homes also, they are viewed as uh, uh, more or less uh, strangers because none of the customary laws and practices I'll give married women the same rights of access to others. Within the patrilineal systems also, we, we talk about uh, daughters and their rights. And we, when within the matrilineal system, we also talk about um, other children. Then uh, I also make mention of land hunger. Anne spoke a lot about um, the operation of um, mining both legal and illegal, both formal and informal. And the number of um, uh, land, agricultural land within rural areas are being in Ghana is, is, is the amount of gold we have under the land. And so a number of rural land also is being turned more and more to artisanal gold mining, which yields uh, quicker benefits than agriculture. And then, of course, Ghana is, so, is highly urbanized, but this high urbanization is, is led by a almost nearly uncontrolled urban sprawl. And this also puts a lot of pressure on land that is available to land holding groups and, and land then that can be given to um, a, a, uh, members of this uh, of the land holding group. So you find out that there's a lot of migration uh, by farming communities, farming households, and the migration also then introduces further uh, insecurities within uh, the access to land. So people can access land through renting, through sharecropping, and, and through hiring. And most of the land holding communities are reluctant to give land to women on their own, but then they can they they are very uh, uh, happy to give land to men who are married. 
So then the whole point about married women and their position within marriage and access to land gets also reinforced by all these customary laws and practices. I think I'll end here and uh, let others address the issue. Thank you, Akua. I'm guessing that this will be a common theme today that when land's in demand and money's involved, women are disadvantaged. Let's get some more insights into women's rights in Nigeria from Aluwa Kemi. Okay, thank you very much, Rene. Um, well, the experiences that um, Akua has mentioned are not quite different from what we have in Nigeria. In Nigeria, we have um, the obstacles that are hindering women from accessing land or ensuring their land tenure security include the customary law. In fact, that's the first obstacle, the customary law. And this manifests in marriage, it manifests in um, divorce and inheritance. Now, for instance, in the marriage, in the family setting, there are incidences where a woman actually wants to buy a parcel of land and the husband thinks it's unnecessary because he's making, he's providing the basic needs of the family and he sees it. He and his family members view the woman's desire to own a parcel of land as an act of misbehavior or an act of trying to equalize with the man and that is frowned at. And then you find out that she's not able to do that because the family, the extended family now, which is guided by patriarchal beliefs, believe that women should not own land. So we have custom. Then when it comes to divorce, when um, the couple have an issue, the couple, yeah, when the couple has an issue, factors such as how many children does the woman have? What kind of children? Yes, what kind? All children are, I mean, everyone, you begin to see um, some ideas that are around male preference or son preference, you know, guiding the distribution of inheritance. And if she's not able to provide a son in the family, she's disinherited. If she has only females, she's disinherited. So customary law also rules in that, uh, in that dimension. Then even within her natal family, it's still the same thing. The father believes that familial land should be handed over to the son because he can be entrusted with the family property unlike the woman upon marriage goes with that family property and you know they lose access to that. So customary law represents a major obstacle and sometimes it overrides statutory laws in Nigeria. Then another obstacle is the issue of land grabbing, which is the forceful entry, eviction, and occupation of landed properties by unlawful individuals. We find um, some individuals within the community, and this is very, very common in communal lands. You find some disgruntled um, elements, as it were, invading a particular property, sometimes chasing out um, the owners of the land, being aggressive and employing different means of violence to ensure that the owner of the land does not carry out any activity on that land. It's usually very violent. And so because of the level of aggression, you know, this discourages women from even wanting to acquire communal land because they feel that they cannot match force with force. And so you find them sometimes having to go through a male relative to help them in acquiring the land, you know, negotiating deals on a parcel of land. So that's also a major issue. Even though it is frowned at, some states in Nigeria have actually enacted laws that frown against land grabbing. We still find that very rampant in, um, in rural areas. It's something that is peculiar in the rural areas. The third obstacle will be lack of awareness on constitutional rights. Now in Nigeria, we have the federal constitution that guarantees every citizen access to land in Nigeria. But then you now find a situation where many women are not even aware of this. They are, they are discriminated against in the rural communities, but they, can, they are not aware that they actually, as a citizen of Nigeria, they have a right to immovable property. We know that education is the key. 
to unlocking human rights. But if you are not aware of what the constitution provides for you, you cannot enforce it. So that's a major issue, both the federal constitution and even the Land Use Act guarantees um, every Nigerian, whether male or female, the right to own a movable property. But most women in the rural communities in particular are not aware of this. And those that are even aware, you know, for some reasons, they find it difficult to pursue and fight for their rights, usually as a result of fear of intimidation from the family. There's this idea that, how, why will I take this person to the court? It's, it's not right. You're a woman. You're not supposed to pursue this. This is for your brother. This is for your husband. So lack of awareness of constitutional rights represents um, another major obstacle. Then the last would be the plurality of the Nigerian legal system. Now, the plurality of the um, Nigerian legal system actually presents a setback in women's access to land and even other forms of property. And the institution of marriage in Nigeria is carried out under different legal systems, which are guided independently by customary laws, religious and statutory laws. The laws that guide marriage in in, in order the Sharia law, for instance, is different from it even contradicts what the statutory law states. Under the statutory law, a married woman has access to property or land as it's were. But then you find out that in the religious laws, she only has access to a certain percentage of inheritance or rights and all of that. So the plurality of the Nigerian legal system presents a setback. The interception of these legal systems actually creates even a gap in the implementation of certain policies that protect women in Nigeria. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Um, you make a really important point that women need to know their legal rights to exercise them. Um, I think we see this all over the world. Uh, let's hear from Justine about obstacles, women's access to land and tenure security in Liberia. Justine. Much really. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to, to speak about these things. And uh, just like my colleagues have said, honestly, the issues are very similar, if not the same, in the three countries or across Sub-Saharan Africa. I will not commit myself to, to North Africa because I'm not experienced in that area. But across South, South, South Saharan Africa, I think the issues are the same. I'm originally from Rwanda, and I can say that everything almost you're talking about here is the same in Rwanda. But uh, I will focus on, on Liberia. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about is that uh, as we are all here, I can see there are 168 people following this forum. It's, uh, I like to say that this is about people. It's not only about women, but also women's dependents and the, 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 the countries at large. And this is a serious issue. So to begin with, I want to start with a, a story of uh, one Liberian woman called uh, Rita, who benefited from uh, the, the, the trainings that are conducted by uh, Landesa and FCI. FCI is the Foundation for Community Initiative. It's a local NGO. Uh, so the story of Rita goes, um, when Rita's father died, she was told by the town chief in uh, uh, Bonya that she could not inherit his land because the tradition of the town only grants land and other properties to male children. Rita and her sisters were not given house spots or farmland. And later they got married and moved out of the community. After Rita's husband died, she had nowhere to go, but only to return to her father's homeland. On, on her return still, she was not given land until there was a training in her community and then after learning about her land rights, Rita went ahead and asserted and claimed her rights to, to her father's land. And when she claimed for her land rights, then she was granted the rights to her father's land. 
uh, I cannot speak to what happened to Rita's sister because they are still married and away from that land. But that's the question that I would pose to everyone who is here. Should women only acquire land from their biological NATO families only because their marriages have failed or their husbands have died and they cannot inherit from their fathers, from their husband's family, as my two colleagues have already said, that a woman is seen as if she's in transition, she's a stranger, either from her marital family and her family, because they all see her as moving. She doesn't belong anywhere. So that's the question I want to leave to there. So coming back to the topic today, as I saw the word root, and that gave me some kind of level of thinking. Root, root to the, to women's, to, root obstacles to women's land rights. And it reminded me something I studied in primary three, which talked about a tap root, that deep root, the root by which other roots grow. And to me, that is patriarchy. My, my, again, my, 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 the other speakers have talked a lot about that, that I'm not going to define or go deep into what patriarchy is. But really this taproot patriarchy, when you look at it, that's why other issues that women face relating to land rights, relating to property rights, whether in marriage, whether in, uh, in their own biological families, it's all rooted into that, whether it's the lack of education and everything. So coming back strictly to Liberia, and I'll run through this quickly, because it's the same and similar to what my colleagues have said. Again, the issue is patriarchy and patrian, patrianity. Forgive me for not being able to say that very well. So literally inheritance of family property and land goes through the so-called representative of the family. So family tree goes by the male children almost across Africa. So because women are not seen to carry that family tree, then they don't inherit that property because they are seen as if it, when they inherit that property or acquire property from their families, then that property is going to benefit their husband's family. So that is one issue. So that issue follows them also into marriage, like again, my colleague has said, I'm not going to say that. So in Liberia, again, like it was said in Nigeria, women are traditionally perceived as property. There's a popular slogan which says, women are property, how can they inherit property? So literally a woman is seen as a property uh, and a, a property to the future husband who marry her. And this is tied to the traditions of dowry and all those kind of things. And when you look at marriage in Liberia, they have both, they have a dual system, statutory marriage and, and customary marriage. And the law somehow somewhere recognizes also uh, de facto unions. But then the de facto unions have no connotation or have no explanation of how property within that relationship is shared. So when you look, and again today with modernity, I'm running through this quickly because it's exactly the same as what my colleagues have said. So today because of modernity in Liberia, you find that the young people getting married they have these lucrative introductory marriages, literally the, the, the customary marriage. And according to the law, it's the first celebrated marriage that is binding. So literally women in statutory marriage have equal rights to property as their husbands. But then because the young people now are celebrating introduction, dowry marriage, they are not even aware that the moment you do that before you register your marriage under law, then that is what is binding your marriage. So anyway, so it's all about patriarchy. And uh, it's the patriarchy that follows women into marriage, into inheritance. And uh, so moving away from marriage and inheritance, the, 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 the gender relations within the domestic uh, relations circles, there is the issue of women's absence in land governance. That is a huge obstacle. Again, it has connotations in patriarchy, but then because women are not there, their issues are not represented. And again, women, other women don't see themselves being able to report the cases that they face. And this also links to access to justice, whether it's informal or formal justice, which is very uh, tiring, which again, 
is also gender biased where uh, land related issues and family, pro family property issues, uh, uh, decisions are made per the custom. So while the law is in place as Anne said, there's still big, there's still lack of understanding and awareness of that law. So by and large, the, the traditional system is still working more than uh, the, the application of the law. So that's another big issue, having no women in leadership. Then there's the big issue of gender roles and gender division of labor, which is again connected to the tap root. So because women have so many roles, the triple gender roles that most of you are aware of, they keep women in Liberia so much in the family. They do farming, taking care of the elderly, taking care of children, taking care of the husband, you know, and then also selling food in the market. So they hardly find time to pursue other development opportunities that would help them to compete or even to understand their rights. Sometimes they don't participate in meetings in public. They are not even expected to speak in public in the presence of men. And again, that's not in the whole country, but in the larger part of the country. So women are still struggling with the, those uh, gender relational issues, the patriarchy of the, the right to speak in public, the right to speak in front of men who represents the family, then the issue of concessions or which has completely evicted people from land in big communities in Liberia, all these issues and who makes decisions on land. Then in accessibility of uh, uh, women in Liberia, the majority of women in rural Liberia are not educated. So that speaks a lot again, them being not educated, they lack, they don't together with gender roles, they lack time and understanding of information and then the self-esteem when they attend meetings sometimes. Uh, we ha they have in Liberia what they call the small English. So when people, when women come to meetings and they can't speak that small English, sometimes it's even a barrier for them to express themselves. And lastly, I'll talk about the newness and the limited understanding of gender equality. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Lastly, I want to talk about um, the newness and the limited understanding of gender equality and women's land rights, or the Land Rights Act that you heard about. This is still a, a big obstacle in Liberia. There's a rigorous move to create awareness around the Land Rights Act. But then this is coming at the backdrop where people are not yet aware of why is this important? Why should we give land to women? Is it an imposition actually from Monorovia by the government and, by the, and the civil society organizations? So again, the understanding of why this is important. Sometimes when we do this work, we forget that the system that is in place has been, it's a way of life that people have lived for generations. So how do we even introduce these rights to them once they are passed into law? So again, going back to the root, the root is that unless we understand the root and how that root came about, then tackling it becomes easier and probably leads to transformative uh, impact. So that's what I want to end with, saying that the lack of understanding of gender, do we have the good ground to talk about these rights within those communities? and then the lack of understanding of the rights themselves that they are provided by the law. But the, when we talk about law also, again, it's not just the Land Rights Act. It's also domestic relations laws, family laws, taxation laws, land-based investment laws. How do all these laws come together to become an obstacle to women's land rights than just pursuing one? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justine. I forgot to say in the beginning, there'll be three questions and then there will be 30 minutes at the end um, for your questions. So we'll go now to the second question. And that is, what are the latest developments of women's land rights in your country? And we're gonna start with Aluakemi in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start by stressing that in Nigeria, 
anything that has to do with tenure security is not gender specific in the country. Nigeria is, um, and the reason is not far-fetched, Nigeria is, a, is deeply patriarchal. And when it comes to women's issues, we may, we, the government tends to be a bit um, slow or in some cases unresponsive in ensuring that the Nigerian women are protected. And um, however, we have statutory laws that protect women's um, rights to land in Nigeria. And the first is the federal constitution, the 1999 federal constitution of Nigeria, which guarantees every citizen the right to immovable property in Nigeria. It draws no distinction on the gender or the sex right now, religion, age, and all of that. It guarantees as long as you are a Nigerian citizen, you have the right to own land, including women in the rural areas. Because um, when we talk about um, land rights within the Nigerian context, I think those that are at the losing end or those that are more disadvantaged are women in the rural areas. Women in the urban areas are not so disadvantaged because of the factor of education. Many women are educated in the urban areas and as such know what to do in order to ensure their rights. So now, after going by that, the federal constitution of Nigeria guarantees everyone access to land. Now, we also have the Land Use Act of 1978. Now, that Land Use Act, as I mentioned earlier, the Nigerian government is not really um, so specific about women owning property or women owning land. They are more interested in procedures of land administration, titling, and all of that, bringing all interests of the land and vesting it in the government. That's what the Land Use Act is actually about. And so in that particular act, there is no difference as to whether this is a man or a woman. Once you're in Nigeria, you can have access to land and you can register the land in your name. Then we have the VAP Act, which I can consider to be the most recent, that's the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2015. And that act actually prohibits any form of violence which includes forceful eviction from property. So while I mentioned that land grabbing is one of the obstacles to women's um, um, rights to land, if they know their rights, they can actually enforce it using the VAP Act. That's if they get a good lawyer that can you know, fight for them. So currently, we don't really any effort right now towards protecting or ensuring tenure security has to do with all Nigerians, not women. Not women. Once you're a Nigerian, you can just, so it's not gender specific. Any law governing land in Nigeria is not gender specific. So that's the level where we are right now. Though NGOs and different um, activists are actually clamoring for more gender specific um, laws and policies that will favor the women. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's interesting that uh, Nigeria was so early actually in guaranteeing equal rights in 1999 already, even though not specific. Um, next we have Justine uh, to talk again about Liberia and what are the latest developments regarding women's land rights in, in Liberia? Justine? Sorry about that, yeah. Uh, I, I was just saying that uh, I think Anne talked a lot about what the developments in Liberia, and luckily enough, Liberia is not such a huge population like in the, the other two countries. So as we speak now, there is like rigorous movement into creating awareness of this land right act starting from the land, uh, the Liberia Land Authority, the civil society organizations, all 
going down there to explain women's land rights. Of course, not necessary that they are everywhere and um, in the country, you find that what is happening today is that most of the work is concentrated in a few counties out of the 15, maybe five or six. But uh, for those few counties where they're going, like I mentioned the case of Rita, is that things are changing. The law is in place now. Of course, the, traditional, the traditions are very conservative and um, really hard to go by, but things are starting to change and women are starting to speak out about their rights and uh, even to attain them. So those are the developments that I'll talk about. Also, the country now is, um, it, it is trying to, to, to establish local uh, land uh, administrative structures, but that is again, very difficult because there is lack of money, that the government doesn't have the money to do that. But development partners such as the UN, Landesa, USAID are all joining hands to, to, to support the government to make sure that this law, that many hands uh, work together to bring it to, into force uh, is, is being implemented at the local level. So there are challenges, but at least for Liberia, I think Liberia being a small population, things are moving on. And I think that law is one of the things to, 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 to approach Liberia about. Okay, thank you, Justine. How about uh, Akua? Can you talk a bit about the recent developments in Ghana? Yes, thanks, Renee. Um, recent developments in Ghana that uh, really are changing the uh, land tenure system and um, how land is acquired and what rights has been the passage of the Land Act in um, uh, last year. And uh, the, the, this Land Act has been a whole process we started in 1999 uh, as part of um, the processes of so-called en enhancing uh, uh, discipline within land acquisition and to attract uh, foreign direct investments. So there's, um, the goals really were to remove the conflicts and um, we had a number of legal instruments, uh, over 166 on land. And the idea was to bring them together, uh, ensure that they were consistent also with other land related uh, uh, laws, like what, what are the statutory instruments that govern the land ministry and, and, and all that. And, and then also land administration, how, how it is managed. And uh, finally, also to reflect the spirit of the Ghanaian constitution, equal access, uh, absence of discrimination, and two things that were important for, for this process also were women's rights. So what are the Ghana's international commitments to make supporting women's rights? And, and finally, environmental consents. The interesting thing in this uh, Land Act, uh, spousal acquisition of land, so the provisions that makes all landed property acquired during marriage to be owned by spouses in common, and whether it is declared or not, because I've mentioned the problematic area of matrilineal and mat uh, patrilineal. And, and in both cases, uh, when uh, husbands die interstate, the properties they leave behind does not devolve automatically to their wife and children. So these were issues that needed to be addressed. And also, uh, also protect women should in case their marriage fails. So then there, uh, there are demands that spouses should register all landed properties acquired during marriage in their joint names. But if they do not, and they register in their own individual names, it is assumed that in so long as the marriage subsisted, uh, it doesn't matter whether one made a direct contribution or not. So long as a marriage uh, subsisted, subsisted during the acquisition of that landed property, it will be deemed to be owned by both parties. Now, as people will say somewhere, the, the uh, sweetness of the pudding is in, is in this con consumption. So what does this mean? I mean, these... The, the process towards the, the, the bill laying before parliament and all that, it, it involved a lot of work, active, activist work, trying to 
uh, get parliamentarians also, mainly men to understand where this law was coming from and all that. But I have time to talk about this uh, in, in response to the next question. But let me mention some of the problems that women face in acquiring land through statutory provisions. And research has shown that really the patriarchal norms that underlie the customary uh, norms and practices that devolve um, a land uh, access and, and use also apply to formal institutions. So uh, earlier on, there have been a mention of the fact that they tend to be male dominated and therefore uh, there are, they are very few men there. But patriarchy also means that women have little, uh, uh, have less education than men. And therefore the, the awareness of what their rights are is, is very low. And even where they are aware also, uh, uh, how can they access these legal uh, uh, provisions, what legal institutions are involved, and, and the whole legal uh, situation also, that sometimes is so unfriendly to women. The number of uh, cases you, ha you have to file and, 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 and time, and sometimes they do not have their resources. Of course, there are uh, women's rights groups that are ready to give women uh, support the pro bono, but then a lot of women are not aware of it. And then the whole notion of what a good woman is. And so if, if your husband should pass, a good woman should be mourning her husband and not chasing after property. Uh, and, 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 and therefore a number of women then will just, uh, just do not have the courage to also uh, stand uh, for their rights. Then there's a question also about a good woman also. And so when women have registered property, uh, uh, title deeds. They have done that with, with, uh, with their husband's name because they don't want to uh, usurp the traditional authority systems in their marriages, or they have even done that in the name of their male relatives and sometimes to their own at, uh, disadvantage. So the efficiency concerns that underlie this bill, we fear, might undermine the equity issues that uh, these provisions uh, seek to bring. And uh, I think that I'll rest here and then hope that uh, questions during question time uh, might allow me to explain some of the issues. Thank you. Thank you, Akula. I will say that women activists have actually achieved quite a bit on the legal front in the last 10 years, which is really exciting. And now on to implementation. So the third question, um, there have been some positive legal movement, as we said, and now we're going to talk. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot Justine. Justine, please. <laughs> Did I lose my, I lost my space. Sorry. Okay. Well, <clears throat> our third and final question refers to lessons that we can learn from positive case studies or measures. So this is my favorite part and I messed it up. <laughs> We'd love to hear from Justine um, in Liberia about some positive uh, movement there. In the, in the chat room, somebody raised a very important issue of gender mainstreaming. And within Liberia, I think this is something that has that we that, that they can show that other countries can borrow from, especially during that period when they were uh, legislating the Land Rights Act when it was a bill. There was really very strong uh, concerted efforts from the civil society organizations, both international and national. And during that time, that's when the Women's Land Rights Task Force was formed that brought together government, all partners working on women's rights, literally gender, not even just land. And from that, uh, and that rigorous involvement with the process throughout the process, writing concept notes and sending messages to the government, sending representatives to the parliament when the bill was being debated and presented. I think that is something that really led to the gender 
sensitive law that we have today, that Liberia has today and very proud of. And in, within this law, it's something that I kept to the end. I didn't want to say it in the previous question. You find that the law provides for equal rights to land for both men and women. It provides for equal participation in land governance for men, women, and youths. It provides, it, it, it broadens uh, community membership whereby you find that previously, according to custom, community membership was only reserved for uh, like patrilineal kind of lineage of the members of the community. So if a woman married in that community, she would only become a member if she's legally married, either dowered or statutorily. Today, they don't recognize that anybody who has lived in the community for seven years plus becomes automatically a member of the community. So the majority of the women that were not members of the community previously are now members of the community on their own right once they have lived there for seven years. Plus the children of the daughters of the community, for example, a daughter married in a man, their children were never recognized as members of that community. So they, were always, uh, they were always regarded as strangers. So again, today the law recognizes them. So this law is very progressive. Uh, additionally, the, the government is also in the process of adopting bylaws. So those bylaws, again, have no choice but to be emulated after this law. So the community will have to follow the law. So what made the change? The change is that there was rigorous participation in the whole process of the making of that law. Two, during the same time and currently, there's been rigorous trainings, for example, the USAID project that was implemented by uh, Tetra Tech and Landesa, together with the Land Authority, really worked so hard to provide evidence. Because at that time, there wasn't even good understanding of women's issues, land issues within Monrovia. So that law provided evidence of what the issues that women were going through. And it's that evidence that helped together with conducting training of trainers, as I mentioned earlier, gender issues and women's land rights were a, a new thing to Liberia. So the condu conducting trainings and awareness raising, putting in place training manuals has really worked to move things out to the front. So that consistent gender mainstreaming at every stage, tapping into the gender di dynamics I think is what has really made the, the change we see today in Liberia. So it was foundational. There are many illustrative uh, examples, but for me, that was the foundation to everything. Thank you so much, Justine. Akua, are there any positive examples you can give us from Ghana? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the examples really, as I mentioned, are two uh, specific um, experiences that we had. Because in the process of uh, getting the bill enacted, there had to be a, little, a bit of activist work. And uh, this was led by the Network for Women's Rights in Ghana, an umbrella organization. So the idea was to find out how are women navigating uh, their tenure insecurities? What examples exist? And how can these examples be upscaled? And, 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 and used to deal with some of the customary restrictions that they face. And, and we discovered two, um, one uh, that worked in the matrilineal south and the other that worked in the patrilineal north. And the matrilineal south was, was dealing with uh, migrant communities. And, and the fact that um, because they, they rented land they, and, and and one thing that I, I failed to mention also is a conception of women as farmers, which feeds into uh, the, the secondary access to land. So women as, are not seen as farmers in their own rights. And whatever they produce really is to supplement what men, men produce. So this, this then feeds into even when they are making a, a, a personal arrangements for land and renting land. So the tendency was to give women, uh, when they rented land, they got it on shorter leases and could not then uh, uh, farm uh, uh, more profitable crops. So this uh, procedure, this, this initiative was worked with traditional rulers and, and, and within this community, the landholders, 
uh, land holding groups and how uh, women's access to land, uh, women's uh, tenure security could be enhanced. And finally, it was possible to get them to agree to enter, to transfer the oral agreement that was made during the um, uh, renting into legal documents that could be signed. So it became possible for women then to renew, even though they were annual, to renew these uh, 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 renting arrangements. The other was the, um, the group acquisition for the patrilineal north, where again, working together with um, um, uh, traditional authorities who were the land holding groups, male heads, getting them to understand uh, 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 women's role as farmers in their own rights and the need for women to get land. And, and, and the group, approach seemed to help because then women were seen as strangers within this land holding group. And so the uh, traditional authorities were prepared and ready to give uh, women land to farm as a group. And the group uh, also then acted as some kind of a protection for these women. It was possible then for these women also to get access to other resources that enhance their farming activity. Now, the, 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 the question uh, here uh, that comes up is, is, is um, how do we fit these into the uh, statutory provisions that the uh, new Land Act is, has, has, has brings and what kinds of opportunities that this um, allow? And we, we see that the, the initiatives now are uh, working towards assisting women's rights groups that work with women on their land rights. To how, how can they develop title deeds and, and how can they work with traditional rulers? And then all kinds of documentaries also that can be shared with, uh, within rural communities that can uh, re uh, um, convince uh, people about the need to give land to women. But at the bottom line is land hunger, which I, which I mentioned. And the fact that most of the land that women get through these activities are those lands that are quickly eaten up by a, a, a large scale acquisition or acquisition for urban residential projects. So the final thing that we need to look at is this a capitalist interest that is driving land reform because then we move away from patriarchy within the customary uh, system. And we, 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 are faced with patriarch, we are faced with capitalist interest that is pushing land for individual uh, uh, use. And in, in this also, whatever benefits that the customary uh, communal access gives rural women is, is going to be lost. And within this also comes the differentiation of women, those who have the resources and therefore can acquire land as, as private uh, individuals. And, and this is the next thing also that we need to look at. Because as, as women acquire land as private individuals, what, does, what do the interests of this group of women also, in terms of protecting their private interests, mean for uh, women, uh, rural women, who can, who can only access land through the uh, uh, communal access? And uh, I think that I rest my case here. And, uh, hope to deal with uh, questions that come up later. Thank you so much, Akua, and thanks for leaving us with a important question about whether capitalism is sort of replacing patriarchy in terms of uh, harming women. The final speaker from Nigeria, Halu Akemi, can you give us any examples from Nigeria? Thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the land laws we have in Nigeria are not um, actually geared towards um, development of the owner of the land, but more about land administration and um, land titling, interest in land being vested, uh, vested in the government. In essence, the government having total control over all lands in Nigeria. However, as I mentioned earlier, we have um, legal instruments that, you know, individuals could draw on to enforce 
their rights. And of course, the examples that we have would be based on women who are aware of their rights and have actually taken it to the courts for the enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, an example comes to mind of a lady who actually, you know, she was divorced and she had the parcel of land which the husband bought for her. And somewhere along the line, there was a struggle over who would take that parcel of land and all of that. But fortunately, the land was registered in her name. And um, that made it easy for her to, you know, take it to the court and ensure that her rights to that land was um, enforced. So while we can say that at the government level, we don't have any pragmatic measure, as it were, to ensure that women are protected, especially women in the rural areas, like I, I have been mentioning right from the beginning of the webinar, women, are, women in the rural areas are the ones that are the most disadvantaged. I would say that once you know your rights in Nigeria, you can actually fight for it now. It's not as automatic. There are other factors that come to play here. There are bureaucratic procedures that need to be followed, which may actually take some time to see that that law is enforced. They talk about the financial um, aspects of it. Many women actually develop cold feet when it comes to pursuing their rights you know, legally because of the um, money involved and all of that. So basically, we don't have any um, any we don't we don't we really don't have any measure put in place to ensure tenure security for women other than what the constitution and other um, documents you know provide. Patriarchal attitudes continue to define women's access to land even at the governmental level. So I think I'll just um, conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you. So we will move now to questions. Um, and uh, these questions will be directed toward panelists. If you have a specific panelist that you'd like to respond to your question, please indicate that. And now I go to the questions. Okay. So this is a question for Akua. In Ghana, there's no legislation that protects women's rights to land after death of their husbands, question mark. And asked together with this question, please could you explain a bit more about the differences in access to land in the matrilineal and patrilineal systems and how the matrilineal system is patriarchal? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Rene. Um... I think um, I have typed some answers, but let me answer these questions. First, yeah, there, there, there are laws that protect uh, women uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, death of husbands. So if husbands should die in test it, and this was one of the very first laws that came up uh, during the military regime. And so we have the intestate succession law that sort of um, uh, um, uniformized all inheritance systems. And so it, 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 uh, ex it allows women to inherit um, household chattel, women and children. Now there's a big problematic area of, of children. And sometimes you find out that where there are multiple wives and then there are also children from other marriages. How, how the distribution uh, is organized becomes problematic. But the law seeks to protect children more than wives. And it really has helped to sanitize the, the environment a bit. Recently also there's, the, uh, there's a bill and um, I needed to check whether how far it has gone. And, but then the land Act has also dealt with some of these things because as I mentioned, the Land Act is, is saying that property acquired during marriage, and this also answers another question, which is a, a talk, asking about cohabitation. So all properties acquired during marriage. Now, whether it is uh, registered or not, in so long as there can be proof that there was a relationship and that relationship uh, meant that the two 
lived and performed functions towards each other as ma married couples would, then that, uh, that will be considered as marriage. And it therefore allowed uh, women to get access to all landed property acquired during that marriage. Women do not have to show proof that they made a direct contribution. All they needed to show was that there was marriage and indeed that property was acquired during marriage. Yeah. Now the second question about uh, matrilineal and patrilineal, because there's a tendency to confuse matrilineal with matriarchy. And matriarchy means that women holding power over men, just like men now hold power over women. Now matrilineal is how we determine inheritance. So who can inherit office and who can inherit property? Office is that if you are chief or you are family head. So traditional office, who can inherit? Who has right to inherit? Now in the matrilineal communities, it is who you share blood with. And the matrilineal uh, system says that you get your blood from your mother and you get your soul from your father. So if you share blood with someone, then that person is your family member. So in this case, children get their soul from their fathers and they get their blood from their mothers. So children and their fathers do not belong to the same family. So if a father acquires property, it goes to his family members, which can be his matrilineal brothers and sisters or a matrilineal sister's children and not his own children. Even though there are customary provisions that enjoins the person who inherits property to take care of the liabilities of the deceased man, somehow these customary practices have dropped. So you have a system where a man dies and then his matrilineal family just drive the women and children out of the house. So this is what this law was supposed to deal with. So matrilineal is not matriarchy, unfortunately. Even though women tend to have certain rights within matrilineal systems that women do not have, some women do not have in patrilineal systems. So there's some laxity, and because then women can have direct access to their land within their land holding groups. They are not seen so much as strangers as uh, uh, women are seen within their uh, patrilineal groups. But then still, it is men that determine uh, uh, how the land is distributed and who gets access to land. And still women are not seen as farmers in their own rights, even within the matrilineal systems. I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so this next one is for all panelists, but we'll start with Justine. In Liberia, Nigeria, or even East African countries, we find gender sensitive policy and legislation, but yet is a huge endeavor to implement law policy that is equitable for men and women. Maybe the problem is that we keep developing policy from the top down, lawyers and NGOs, and far from reality, could it not be better to build gender policy on land and everything else through dialogue and negotiation, but from the ground up? Justine? Oh, yeah, I can't agree with that. Uh, I can't agree with it in more. It's, it's, it's Justine, well we cannot hear you. You're too soft. Oh, sorry. Do you hear me now? Not yes, very well. Have, oh, what's happening? I haven't done anything on my volume. That's a bit better. Go ahead. That's better? Yeah. So I wanted to say that I can't agree more with the statement. Uh, truly, I think laws in most countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, are made from, from the cities, from offices. Uh, and there's enough research that shows that if laws were made from bottom up, it's not only the fact that it's going to based on experiences, the real experiences of the people and the ways of life, but it also, that time will also work as an awareness raising situation. So literally action oriented kind of approach. So I totally agree with Aileen. I think it's Aileen who, who raised that issue that uh, where possible. But then we remember that sometimes these laws are done in, uh, in a situation where there isn't enough funds 
to conduct that rigorous bottom-up kind of situ, kind of uh, lawmaking across the country when you talk about really sometimes big countries. Of course, Liberia, the population is not that big. But again, whether, whether there was money to take that approach was another issue. But uh, I totally agree that there is need to intentionally start to do laws from ground up. What's that? Yeah, it would be better. But not also forgetting that all of us, including the politicians and the cities and the villages, we are raised in the same cultures. It's us who come from the villages sometimes into the cities. So that kind of mindset change, changing the norms is needed from if, even for the politicians. So working at all levels rather than just the bottom or the up is I think what is more uh, needed when the resources are available. Thank you, Justine. Do either of the other two of you like to answer that question or to move on to a new one? Okay. Um, I think I have a slight um, um, difference to that. Yes, it would be okay to have a bottom-up approach, but I also think that um, the system of government in these countries needs to be considered. Most in a democratic setting, for instance, Democracy, democracy emphasizes representation. In other words, policies and laws are made through representatives. I think um, what would be most effective is if we have a higher representation or let's say equal representation of the women in, um, you know, in these government institutions, because we find out that um, even in politics, women are discriminated against. You know, in Nigeria, we are still trying to get to a point where we would have about 33% um, participation of women in politics. We've not yet gotten to that level. So I believe it's not even about the bottom-up approach, but more of um, equal representation. When women occupy decision-making um, offices from the grassroots, we have local governments in Nigeria now that are headed by men. In fact, most local governments these local governments reach out to people at the grassroots. Most local governments are headed by, women, by men, rather. And, um, you know, they may not be sensitive to the plight of the women if, if um, they may not be able to, you know, also come up with policies or activities that will favor the women, as it were. But if we have females occupying leadership positions right from the grassroots, you know, up to the top tier of government, I believe that, you know, there would be an improvement. So that's my own take on it. Thank you. Thank you. Akua, do you want to add anything or? No, I think that we, we, we should take other questions. Okay. okay. Um, so this is for all panelists again. Do women in Ghana, Liberia, and Nigeria face challenges in buying land? And can someone on the panel share experience on the issue of women who are cohabitating and working along with their partner to acquire property? Who would like to go first? Okay, I would um, like okay. to say something. Yes, women do experience severe challenges when it comes to acquiring lands. Um, you know, it's not even about their financial power now. It's not about being able to afford the land. But um, there are invisible laws, as we've been talking about, customary laws that actually shape behavior towards a woman's um, desire to buy land. And um, sometimes you find out that even this, okay, most communal lands are, are kept under the control of the head of that community. He decides who is going to allocate the land to, and um, whoever he allocates the land to decides who is going to sell the land to. Now you find out that when a woman approaches, you know, a community head and tells the community leader that he wants, she is interested in buying a parcel of land, he may not outrightly state it that he doesn't want to sell to her, but there is just this patriarchal attitude and the woman gets it that, oh, could it be that this man does not want to sell this land to me? Now, if that same woman brings a man, maybe her husband, her brother, or any male relative who accompanies her to the community leader, 
the whole narrative changes. You find the man saying things that, okay, let's talk man to man. And you begin, she's going to drop the money for that land. She's the one buying the land, but they feel more comfortable negotiating with a male. So definitely they experience severe challenges. And it's even more when they perceive that is a single lady, she's not married or she's divorced. You know, they see her as promiscuous. Why would she divorce her husband and all of that? So patriarchal attitudes actually, you know, shape, um, shape such relations between the seller and the buyer. And as a matter of fact, it, there was a study that was conducted and uh, most of the respondents said they would actually prefer male clients to female clients. And that tells it all. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else want to respond? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, go on. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I can share the experience from Liberia. In Liberia, it's different from community to community. Some communities are becoming more uh, responsive to women buying and acquiring land, although traditionally they have to be accompanied by men, and that is changing probably with the new awareness raising. But uh, it's true that in some other communities, a woman cannot even buy a land for herself. Uh, there's a story of one politician, I will share that so quickly, who told us that uh, she bought, her and her husband bought a land from a community, but the community leader, the traditional leader refused to put the woman on the, on the, on the contract because he believed that women should not go on the, on the land contract. So what they did, the, the lady and the husband, what they did, this is a female minister. What they did is that they refused to pay him the second half and the husband told the chief or the, the traditional leader that the money belonged to the woman. And unless he adds her name on the contract, then she will not be the second half. So that's how hard it is, even for this, I've seen comments about the difference between educated and uneducated women, but this is how hard it is even for women when they are educated, a minister in the government. So there are still obstacles for women to be able to buy land. And this again links to the situation of cohabitation. Cohabitation is such a big issue when it comes to land and family property rights, I think across Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think it's an area that's understudied including in my country, Rwanda, where, you know, uh, women's promotion is really hard. But also in Liberia, the law only, when it comes to, 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 to land rights, it only covers women who are formerly married. And the problem is that even where laws, for example, like in Kenya, require that uh, a woman brings evidence. Usually women have no evidence to show that they contributed to the property at hand. Even when they buy property in their own right with their own money, the culture is that property belongs to the man. So she will entrust the money with the man to go and buy the property. And so if she's in cohabitation, at the end of the day, the poor woman will have nothing to show that she contributed to this, this land. So the, 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 the issue is the social norms. The more we can create awareness of these things, but also empower women to know the tactics around patriarchy and how they can protect their own rights to property and land. Meanwhile, the laws are changing and the mindsets are changing. Even for a woman to know that if I contribute to this property, I have my evidence with me if it's needed. So empowering women is a very key issue here. Thank you. Thank, yeah. thank you. Akua? Yeah. yeah, thanks Renee. Uh, so I, um, I will begin with a cohabitation. I think I mentioned it briefly, but I want to emphasize it. In fact, one, one of the um, things that the new labor, act, the new land act has tried to deal with is this cohabitation. Because we realize that in, um, in the number of the migrant communities, you know, so the woman has a first child, then they're thinking that there will be marriage. And by the time you are aware, she probably has four or five children and it's 20, 30 years. And then the whole point about performing the customary rights uh, 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 becomes pointless. And, and, and then of course, the ability also to register the relationship that becomes another burden. So what this law is saying is that in so long as there is proof of marriage that you perform the services of a spouse. Now the problem is, is finding someone 
to go and, 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 and stand behind you, to, 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 to stand with you throughout the, the entire process. And, and the process of land acquisition is fraught with a lot of patriarchal attitudes. At first of all, the woman's ability to even acquire enough uh, financial resources to purchase land. So domestic arrangements are such that, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a truck moving in my neighborhood, so if it's making too much noise, you forgive me. Now, the, the domestic arrangements are such that women seldom have enough time to acquire the uh, required resources to go and purchase land first. And second, when they do, um, do they find the process of titling uh, uh, friendly? Do they have the time? And, and, and then uh, uh, thirdly also, to what extent does a marital relationship allow her to push herself up as a woman who is acquiring property and still uh, maintain the, the uh, marital relationship? If, if men within certain traditional communities, like this chief felt that it was an affront for a woman to have a name on, on, uh, on the title deed. So these are all the tensions that women, women uh, face. So the, the statutory provisions in Ghana are trying to encourage women and really are really very supportive of women acquiring land. But then the patriarchal norms are such that they still discourage women from acquiring land. And th these are the issues that we, we need to deal with. What kinds of structures do we set up so that women who want to uh, register land uh, can do so without uh, having to deal with time, without having to deal with financial resources and all that? What, what, what kind of um, awareness creation do we make so that women do not feel that they're undermining their men if, if they uh, acquire property in their own names. These are issues that uh, we need uh, to be addressing in the next line of how we support women's land rights. So we only have a few minutes left um, and we won't get to all of the questions, many of them very interesting and good. Um, Maybe we should each have, have each of you wrap up uh, and in about 30 seconds, uh, give us some um, ending comments, please. Why don't we start with you, Akua? Yeah, uh, thanks, Renee. I think that my few seconds of running up is dealing with Salome Yemeni's uh, question. What role can that, the diaspora play in ensuring that women's rights in sub-Saharan Africa implemented. I think that the diaspora will, will, will do well to be looking at uh, um, international policies around trade, around foreign direct investments, and what they mean for national uh, uh, land tenure systems in, 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 in general. And because very fast, the land that we have available within uh, sub-Saharan Africa, is, 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 is getting uh, taken up through large scale land acquisition. So uh, the land acquisition procedures and, and the, everything drops, everything collapses, all the uh, systems and structures we set in place to protect women's rights collapse in the face of large scale land acquisition. So this is where the diaspora can, the role that diaspora can play in looking at international uh, um, arrangements and, and uh, organizing more in terms of uh, uh, activism around that and how, and finally, uh, how women's, uh, the land can be secured for us to secure women's land rights within the little land that is left available for us. Thank you very much. How about uh, Alu Akemi? Do you have any final key messages you want us to hear? Okay, thank you very much. Well, I would um, just conclude by saying that um, education is very key. Awareness of your rights is very key. And um, most battles are actually fought and won when you know what you are fighting for. And then uh, you are armed to actually fight for it. Most of these 
these issues wouldn't even be coming up if many are aware that there are provisions of the law that can actually be you know, invoked in favor of them. So I will just conclude that um, a lot has to be done on the area of awareness. And I believe that once that is achieved, we can, we can deploy the legal, legal resources that are available for us. Then I would just like to quickly um, emphasize something. I saw a comment here that, okay, um, it's not in all places in Nigeria. It's not in all the states in Nigeria as it were that women cannot buy land. That is very true. Nigeria is a heterogeneous country. We have different tribes in Nigeria and each of these tribes have their peculiar laws that guide them. So in, the laws in Southwest may be different from the laws governing them in the North or in the South South or in other regions of the country. But generally speaking, it's a, it's a patriarchal attitude that there is a male preference when it comes to women buying land. It's a general practice. There may be exceptions, but that is what we find even in literature. There are studies that support this. So I will just end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much. Justine, you get the last word. Um, I would say that I agree with everything that has been said, but I also want to say that to call to the attention that it's the system that we are fighting with. These issues affect women and men all together, all of us. So it's not a war against men, it's not a war against or a war for women, but it's the systems that we need to deal with. We have been talking about the root. The root from the conversations and the chats we have here is that, yes, the laws can be in place, good laws can be in place, but unless we go back to the root of the issue, which is the way of life that people live and address those patriarchal tendencies, working with the people, understanding their language, understand why they are living that life and work with them to change those issues, then we shall always come back to square one. It will be a battle, a war rather than something that should change naturally. So I call all of us here to go back to our communities and work with the people to change those uh, cultural beliefs. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. So this ends uh, for today, but check out the new country portfolios. Um, don't forget to uh, let us know whether you liked the webinar or not, and please subscribe to the LAND portal. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, and it's been fun. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.